to the talk about um, from megatons to megawatts. Uh, this track will be translated into English from German by the C3 lingo. Uh, at the mics for you are Oscar and MFA. We will translate into English for you and feel free to leave feedback for us on Twitter at C3Lingo or under the hashtag C3T. Semester, wenn ich richtig bin, mhm. und ähm, wird uns ein bisschen was über ähm, nukleare Abrüstung bzw. Megatons to Megawatts erzählen, wie man äh, militärische Güter in Energie umwandeln kann. Dazu mit einem herzlichen Applaus, Julia. Dankeschön. Hallo. Hi. Wer kennt das? Who, who doesn't know it? Hands up. Who knows this? In the 90s when we showed these things, uh, all of the hands went up. But this is a screenshot from a movie that was called what? Exactly. War Games. The movie is from 1983. And 1983 was the high period of the Cold War and Cobalt and the thermonuclear war was a real threat scenario that people were experiencing in their lives. And they had constant fear about a coming nuclear war. And by the end of the 80s, the global inventory of nuclear weapons was roughly at 40,000 in Russia and again roughly 25,000 in the US. So you can imagine that roughly 60,000 nuclear warheads uh, in cellars or silos uh, are just waiting uh, to be sent out. So in this movie War Games, it's about game theory and uh, a mathematician that uh, is trying to uh, not just go into things like chess, but um, uh, also uh, getting into scenarios for a global thermonuclear war. Okay, and so uh, very suddenly there was the whole problem with the Cold War and it suddenly wasn't really there anymore. After 1989, you know what happened. Uh, the, the old Russia didn't exist anymore the way it did before. And so the issue was that we suddenly had 40,000 nuclear warheads in a country that didn't really uh, get governed properly anymore and uh, was kind of broken at the time and didn't have proper structures. They had uh, in, in, in the government, that is, uh, they didn't have uh, protection strategies uh, for all of those warheads and And in the year 91, there was an article in the New York Times where a journalist suggested that what about if all of this this old um, old state, if we just bought all of their warheads and um, looked into maybe using them, degrading the material and made it usable for nuclear power. We, I will talk more later about how that would actually work. This program was called Megatons to Megawatts, and it actually existed. It was between 93 and 2013, and the old Soviet Union actually sold uh, highly enriched uranium to the US uh, to transfer, uh, to convert into low enriched uranium. Um, from former Russia actually used this material uh, to, and gave it to the US because they, they had a lot left over. And 500 tons of this HEU were converted into burning material for nuclear power plants. And this actually 
um, led to 10% of the entire electric needs of the US being covered by this program. So this was actually a very relevant uh, amount of energy. It was ju not just a, a little thing replacing one power plant, but it did make a big difference. Okay, so I said 40,000 warheads in the US and 55,000 in the US. I'm sorry, uh, Russia was the farmer. And so these are, this is the data for 2018. This is roughly how much exists, uh, roughly 600,000 in the US, in, in Russia, and 6,000 in Russia, and 6,000 in the US. So, uh, of course, there are others as well. Uh, China is a growing one that uh, has uh, roughly more, um, which was also impacted by the Cold War. Pakistan is also growing, which is uh, its own story. Um, uh, we uh, we have to wonder who actually taught them. Um, there's another topic there about uh, the the technology and the knowledge involved, and uh, not just the uranium or the plutonium. The proliferation is actually way more than that. So, in effect, there's not just plutonium and uranium in in warheads. Uh, I'm going to use the word warheads instead of the German version. Um, so there's also highly enriched uranium that is not actually uh, in warheads but uh, in, in storage. Uh, the same is for plutonium. And uh, I, I can explain this later, but um, it is mostly a side product uh, in the operation of certain kinds of nuclear power plants. And so a lot of this material is actually available uh, in inventory. And uh, depending on what sources one uses, there's between 1,500 to 1,200 tons of uh, highly enriched uranium uh, that are lying around and between 200 and uh, 250 uh, tons of plutonium which uh, is available and could be used for this, which is actually what it's for. It's not very usable in other ways. The principle, the principle of this is very simple. You take something which you can split up, something which you can fizz, something for starting the whole procedure and something for for boosting the thing. Uh, there are multiple designs depending on whether you use with plutonium or whether you use uranium, whether you use boostings. Boostings are for, for um, pure fission weapons are usually not really exist anymore. Things like Big Boy, um, the, which were used in Hiroshima, were um, pure splitting weapons. There you need a certain amount of splittable material and a certain geometry for the whole thing to produce more neutrons per, per time unit that it's use, using it by itself and therefore it's going up. For boosting you have the same thing but it's just uh, you have a, you have a uh, ratio of about one so the, the amount which is used is pretty much the amount which is uh, produced. Boosted fission works with the addendums, so there's a little, which is usually deuterium or tritium, and these these mean that there's not a that there's not a compute fission which is initiated, so there's a there's a little bit of. Uh, a little bit of uh, neutron production which is started at the beginning, but it's not exploding up. But because because if you have more neutrons, which happens, which are produced, um, that is called boosted fission, because if you have more neutrons, there's new, more reactions ha happening. Um, that's usually what is, what is also um, termed uh, hydrogen weapons. So all these bombs usually have a physics package, so that's the package where there's usually all these um, all these things inside. On the left hand side you see a picture of, um, so it's an old picture because current pictures, getting them is pretty difficult because, um, because it's pretty difficult to get them. If you're taking the middle of the of the of the left picture, 
and you're going a bit to the legs, this metal piece, that's the physics package. And the shimmer of this can be seen on the right-hand side. Of the left, you see the classic atomic bombs, the classic fission bomb that we've been talking about. And on the right-hand side, you have the the thermonuclear weapons, the, it's combined um, It's combined fission w for creating enough um, temperature in order to start the fusion process. So you have the splitting, the fission, as well as the fusion, the kern melting. And therefore they have a bigger, um, the bigger power. I think I don't have to explain how fission actually works. So in the principle, you have a, um, a particle like a heavy, a heavy core, like something of uh, number um, 90 or above. And on that, you're shooting a neutron. And the neutron can do multiple things. So it can either hit the uranium core and it can split it and therefore creates energy and splitting materials and further neutrons. Or otherwise, it can be captured. So there's a core in the middle. On that, uh, neutron hits, and the neutron and the core just takes the neutron and becomes something else. The, um, the order number will change, and which will be another mass number and other properties. And the new core, the re as a result, the new the product of this reaction can have other um, split processes and can be split up into other elements. So something like better minus um, splitting or better, better, better plus radiation. And as a result of all of this, energy is created. And this is energy is created. The energy which is created on top of the um, on top of the splitting process is energy which um, which uh, drives the next splitting. And in a nuclear power plant, the rate of um, creating neutrons to to start a, to start the new uh, next set of reactions is the same as the rate which is used for starting this reaction. So that's the so-called criticality. If this criticality is above one, you have a nuclear bomb, which if it's if it's less than one or one, it's self-limiting. So therefore, it's overall controllable. Every every nuclear power plant typically works at 1.000 and a little bit. Um, and this is really where you have to where you have to control the whole um, plant and where you have to make it stable by tuning that. So now I'm going to explain a little bit about uh, things. So so natural uranium is a mixture of different isotopes. So there's uranium 235, uh, but it's mostly uranium 238. Um, 235 is only in, in trace, tracer pieces. And basically, everything um, is created by, by splits, by splitting it up, by fission or by activation. For, for natural uranium, it's 0 0.7 or more accurate, 0.711% of uranium-238. And the rest is, well, almost all of the rest is uranium-238 and a little bit of, of other substances, or the other isotopes of uranium. It's not quite clear which ones. Low enriched uranium LU is a slow, a small enriched uranium. It has a, a part of uranium 238 of below 20%, and the rest is usually uranium 238. Highly enriched uranium has above 90% of uh, uranium 235, and thirdly, there's depleted uranium DU, which is um, less than 0.7% uranium-235. Everything which is less than 0.7% um, uranium-235 is depleted uranium. In, from from de about de-enriched uranium, you can actually publish books and, and whole, whole presentations about it that. So, so basically, there's a whole discussion about how how, uh, how frightening this all is. Uh, weapons and basically weapons, there are whole arsenals of weapons which are created from depleted uranium because it's kind of produced all the time by nuclear power plants. And uh, yeah, you can basically use it a lot of the time as as um, as barrier breaking ammunition. And so basically, it's not. It's usually something you put on t onto the waste and leave it there until you need it. Uh, the same thing you have for plutonium as well. So this is, for example, weapons grade plutonium. 
So it's a mixture of plutonium-239 and plutonium-240. Usually plutonium-240 has a, has a weight ratio of less than 6.5%. Um, it doesn't want to split that easily as uh, plutonium-239. And therefore you need a... Therefore, you need a well, a, a bigger part of uh, plutonium 239. Mox is a is a um, is a fuel. It's it's the abbreviation for mixed oxide fuel. For that, you can basically take as as whatever you want. Usually, it's uh, 93. But, uh, usually, it's a uh, it's seven percent plutonium 239 and 93% um, uh, natural uranium. And it's. Um, not just about their energy generated. Okay, so there are a big amount of various uh, nuclear reactor types. Uh, they in general do the same thing. Uh, you did see the, the Chernobyl movie uh, by Valery Legasov. Uh, he explains really well what a reactor actually is. So there is uh, burning material that's needed. Uh, you also need a neutron airbag, a, a moderator that uh, breaks the neutrons. Uh, so they have a, a smaller uh, cross section. And then you need a cooler, that something that actually takes the heat uh, to bring it to the turbine so the turbine turns and generates electricity. And all of these parts exist in any nuclear power plant, in any nuclear reactor. and. Um, Sometimes the cooling system is different, but uh, in the end effect, uh, the, the known systems are fairly similar. The, the pressure water reactor and the boiling water reactor are very similar. And uh, they work with uh, low enriched uranium and uh, these MOXs. And the, the CANDU is a, a Canadian version, it's a Canadian uh, development uh, that works, uses natural uranium the way it comes from the earth basically. Um, you don't have to uh, enrich it or de-rich it and can just be operated directly with that and maybe also MXs. And then my, my favorite reactor is the RBMK. Um, it also it has a interesting properties. It, is fr uh, based also based on the Cold War. It is had been built uh, mostly for uh, bridging uh, gaps, and uh, it it can actually have its burning material replaced during operation. You don't have to shut it down and cool it down and then uh, boot it up back up again. Uh, but uh, instead, there is a crane that can just pull the material out and. Um, Basically, uh, with the system, you can automatically, while in operation, um, use some uh, natural uranium or low enriched uranium, uh, lower it into the reactor, and depending on how it's currently running, uh, whether it's on low uh, low power, you can, um, depending on the, the operational efficiency, um, you can uh, insert or remove uh, the burning material. You can uh, do fission uh, to produce energy or you can uh, breed, uh, which means that you can uh, uh, create plutonium from natural uranium, for example. And then there is a there are new versions uh, in, in the race, uh, which are liquid molten salt um, reactors that work with mixed oxides and um, are more resource friendly and uh, but they're in, in effect also working with these burning material um, systems and um, then there are the liquid molten fast breeding reactors that um, actually were covered at uh, Car West here uh, they don't know how uh, I don't know whether it actually was operational um, and then there's the uh, advanced heavy water reactor, which is an Indian development, uh, which is also liquid uh, molten salt and uh, is also a breeder. Okay, so the, the fuel cycle that, um, that uh, we get from natural uranium, which is mostly uranium-238, and then by putting that into a reactor and... Uh, 
shooting it with neutrons, uh, so to say, and uh, with uh, a certain uh, cross-section in there that can be used, and then it will be transformed into uranium-239. Uh, the, the molar mass changes. Uh, it, it stays uranium, but the, the number uh, changes, and it, it changes from uranium-238 to uranium-239. And then from there, uh, there are two various um, uh, types of uh, better uh, dissipation to uh, so this is from book. Uh, this this um, this is actually uh, has a has a printing error. It's not N O. It's N P. So uh, from the uranium two thirty eight, we are breeding uranium two thirty nine, and then uh, with beta minus dissipation, it uh, falls down to uh, this N O two thirty nine. And from this, you can also initially create energy. And the same thing you can also do for thorium. Um, so this is from a fert. This is called a fertile isotope because it's you, you can you can breed it quite easily. And this, which is actually um, which is actually split up in the end by the fission, is not thorium itself. It's the uranium which is uh, created in the process. So. So the others can also the others can also produce energy, but but which what can be efficient uh, efficiently is the uranium which is in there. So so one problem how you can re recycle it uh, um, is is to do with this. I will talk about this later. Um, so one question is what what is the inventory of uh, of depleted uranium? What are the amounts which are available? So one idea could be we can we can take the whole inventory of highly enriched uranium and and just do down blending. So we are just mixing it with the depleted uranium, and from this we can create something which we eventually can put into a reactor. Loy, for example, could be created in this path. And from this you can potentially uh, drive a reactor and produce energy. So from this you you have uh, you have solved two things at once. You don't have the highly enriched uranium anymore, and you have also solved the um, depleted uranium and, and I mean the other things you can do with depleted uranium is producing um, ammunition but I mean it's it's pretty it's pretty still very very active so this is still a problem so Question. so yeah you need a, a lot of uh, measures in order to take care of this so to to have a do a back of the envelope calculation from uh, 1350 tons of high rich uranium what can we do with it so it depends a little bit on how you want to create uh, which, which type of LU lawyer you want to create um, depending on how many percentage of uranium-235 you want to have in there. It depends a little bit on the reactor as well, so a pr high pressure water reactor for example. From f using that you have about uh, 50, 40 gigawatts per day. So the, the um, nuclear power plant will, be, will, pre will create about um, uh, 40 gigawatts per day of power, which would be for an average power plant of about one gigawatt. So this is quite a lot, actually. So this is just from this uh, 1,340 tons of uh, highly enriched uranium, which, which, which are from these uh, warheads that we have been talking about before. There's more, but these are the numbers you can actually find somewhere. So actually uranium is not the problem here. The problem that we have is actually the plutonium. Because we have, as we have seen before, there's, we have seen before how much plutonium there is around. So this is now a different source which has different numbers. Because, well, I said before that I can't really say how much numbers, uh, about these numbers, I can't really say how much is, is around there. But we are always usually around between 200 and 500 tons, um, I would say. 
That's usually a pretty good estimate. So the question is, what do we do with this plutonium now? So, so uranium we can just blend down, we can just use depleted uranium with it, mix it in, and then we just put it back into the reactor. So we're just building ourselves new plutonium with this, however, as we saw before. So that's just what happens when you when you use, when you shoot your neutrons onto uranium-238, then you get uranium-239, it does two beta decays, and then it gets plutonium-239. So it's basically a zero zero calculation. So just you 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 you're using warheads on the one end, but you you but you're creating material for new warheads. So this is well, this is a question whether one should do that. So what do we do? What we need is some cycle which doesn't have the uranium inside. I have said before that I will that I will say what, what this cross section, neutron cross section actually is. Effectively a reactor doesn't have neutrons of the same energy. <laughs> so so there is a certain probability that a neutron of pro energy X will will initiate a, a process of, uh, of fission, and this is really dependent quite a lot on uh, energy, as you can see in the blue curve on here. So we, which are which are actually high, uh, which are oscillations of the core inside. So the problem is that if the neutron only has a little change in energy, the reactor efficiency changes a lot. So, uh, yeah, the, the fission there is... Um, and the, the thermal calculations are the energies are roughly 10 to the minus 3 uh, mega electron volts. Um, so, let's... Uh, down there you can see mega electron volts, that's a energy amount for physicians that work with very small uh, energy amounts, that's uh, a, that's the unit that we use, uh, that's uh, roughly um, a mega electron volt is roughly 19 joules, which is um, not always weirdly for um, usage in, in physics. But uh, mega electron volts is the energy uh, that we use on the x-axis, and on the y-axis we have um, something that's called barns. A, a one barn is roughly 10 to the minus uh, 24 square centimeters, um, which is a, a an area which is r roughly represents the area um, the 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 chance that a um, reaction occurs, and uh, barns are the unit for that. Um, uh, a barn is a, the probability for a certain reaction happening, um, which is, of course, uh, a nice security by security feature because uh, what a barn is is not that commonly known. Uh, so what we can see here is that we have a very big differences in, in magnitudes uh, between the uranium-238 and uh, the things that actually interest us, for example, the plutonium. Um, I don't have a laser pointer right now, but what you can see is that it's not very parallel. Uh, some is actually way slower, and then there's a reaction in the plutonium, for example. And if you imagine that this mixed oxide that we have uh, th and that we can use for burning material uh, are made from union, uh, uranium-238, for example. You can see that if we mix those, uh, we need to have different zones in the reactor where the neutron levels are different, um, but which is difficult when to, to separate them. Um, so it's different. Uh, to, it, it's difficult to, to separate the uranium and the plutonium uh, because we have uh, very mixed uh, burning materials. So how do we do this? Th that's the reason for why this is hard. So as we said earlier, there is this breeding process 
that happens, which uh, gives us the uranium-239, which we actually wanted to have less of. Um, but uh, so this is not an option. So as an alternative, we have this thorium cycle, which is very interesting because all of the thermal and liquid gas reactors work with this. So there is already a lot of research into this uh, that has happened. And uh, a lot of these fast breeders were developed then, uh, which is actually pretty similar, which is um, it works with slower and less energy dense uh, neutrons. Uh, but yeah, we can use these for the things that we want to breed. It, uh, and they, it, they were used for breeding the things that we needed a lot in the Cold War for the highly enriched uranium uh, that, um, and the plutonium that was supposed to be generated for all of the weapons. So this variant was actually very interesting then. Um, and now we thought that, in effect, when thinking about the thorium cycle, maybe we have a cycle where we can uh, prevent the regeneration of these elements. So maybe can we, inside of the thorium cycle, go in there and build a burning material that uh, uses the thorium and works with it, but also uh, uses the plutonium-239 and also uses that and processes it. So we need a reactor that can do that. And that doesn't really exist. So theoretically, we have to think about maybe the thing we want to do is build our own reactor type, build a reactor type that could, in end effect, uh, dissipate and um, use this plutonium, which is very difficult because the scattering uh, cross-section is in this weird area that we don't actually want to use, and it's very difficult to keep this running in a normal reactor. Uh, these fast breeders, for example, work a little bit like this, but uh, they're on a very way different scale. And then we would need, so yeah, the red curve, that's the fast breeder uh, that uh, is uh, great for the plutonium and that's where it wants to split. But um, the, the pressure water reactors um, actually don't really do anything in that area. So the plutonium just stays the way it is, uh, is lying around there. And the solution is is already shown in here uh, as another uh, shortcut. It's this TMSR. So yesterday I, I thought about it with some colleagues and we were thinking about it, had some thought experiments about uh, without going into technical detail, just like what would we theoretically need to, to build this. And theoretically, we would need a reactor where we can have various neutron temperatures in there. So uh, we can have uh, reactions with higher energies and uh, also the ones with low energies. And so there is no really no actual reactor that where this is all similar. So this is actually controllable. And surprise, this is actually done. So these TMSR reactors are a, a new idea for how to build these reactors. And when one thinks about how to build these, you'd have to think about how all of the, the different core loading operations happen. And so you just use MCMP, but these reactors where actually a lot of different fuel types are, are used, uh, they already exist, and um, the the one one of the reactors, the, the Ling reactor, uh, actually has the same problem. They're, they were built in a time where highly enriched uranium wasn't really a problem, where we just had lots of it and just threw it into the reactor. But nowadays, it's this is just not done anymore because um, all of these uh, burning rods are uh, lying around in cellars and uh, becoming an issue. So we don't want to have this weapon-grade uh, nuclear material lying around. So this is a security issue as well as a, a nuisance. Okay, all right. <laughs> all right, so 
the, this this problem exists. So how can we build a reactor where we can have all of the highly enriched uranium and use it in, in, in just these few uh, rods that are used for highly enriched uranium? So some simulations were done um, with uh, this MCNP system, uh, which is used for neutron simulations. Uh, so you just build your reactor and then you think a lot about uh, which uh, burning rods should be where, where, which reflectors should be where, and uh, all of the other building parameters and just rebuild it. Um, so this is a trigger reactor where we're thinking about whether replacing one of these burning rods uh, with something that is less highly enriched. And uh, that's exactly what one has to do with these thorium and plutonium mixed cores. So the solution is that in the middle you create an area where the neutrons are uh, working with way higher energies and then towards the, the borders, uh, to the boundaries of the reactor, uh, they have smaller energies. And then theoretically uh, we can burn our plutonium to 39. Okay, but the problem is, what kind of a reaction is that? It, it splits, but, and it doesn't just uh, create its, its, its parts, the, the, the things that cre are created when splitting, um, which we can see on the x-axis, but also um, what happens is that what comes with this is that we are also producing plutonium 240, um, which is the, the x axis why there is years. So, this is the amount of years that this reactor would have to run for the plutonium to actually dissipate. And uh, this is what it would take to, to actually uh, use fission to, to dissipate this, this plutonium. And so, why by using this uh, kind of reactor, we are actually producing a different kind of plutonium and we have the same problem as before. So, this doesn't really help. It's not as splittable as uh, plutonium-240, so it's not as usable for weapons, but it uh, is uh, radiating just as much and uh, still just as much as a problem in terms of its half-life. So, the, the, even the weapon-grade plutonium can be removed and uh, used for energy production, but it still produces other problems. And I don't really know if plutonium-240 is actually a lot better than 239. So this, it is kind of an advantage, but it doesn't really make a difference. So the, the, the waste economy there is just uh, creating new waste, which uh, we already discussed uh, at the last camp. Um, where we talked about the, the energy sources per terawatt hour and the, the waste is never really used in any of those uh, power calculation costs uh, is factored in what the, what the disposal of the waste actually costs. So plutonium-240 is not that much better than 239. In terms of prof proliferation, it's probably better, but in terms of waste, it's uh, just as bad. So what, what would we do with this? It's a kind of a, a sad thing to think about. So when we look at it, we see this megatons to megawatts program, but it's not... It's not actually in such a way, um, it was not successful in such a way that the inventory of these materials has actually gone down. And uh, when one looks at uh, China and, for example, India, uh, you can see that they are actually uh, widening their nuclear arsenals and not um, reducing them. And then there's this theory that a lot of nuclear power reactors are actually just running there to produce more plutonium, which um, of course only works in uh, breeding reactors, uh, but that's, you can buy this of course, but then there are other countries that don't actually want to give this away because it's kind of a, a power issue. So. I think uh, in the end I would rather play uh, chess or go instead of participating in this global war 
and I don't think that uh, this is a a sacrifice that we should make. Um, so this should maybe be discussed in a different context, but it uh, will probably go into too much detail for, for now. Uh, this was, of course, just a, a very superficial overview, but this is roughly how it could work. Thank you. That's all. This talk was translated by the C3 Lingo. Talking to you were Oscar and MFA. You can leave feedback about our translation on Twitter at C3 Lingo or under the hashtag C3T. We will continue with the questions next. Derweil, während dem ihr euch da vorbereitet, glaube ich, hatten wir vorhin schon mal kurz darüber gesprochen. Du hattest auch gerade. You had it in your uh, talk right now. There is uh, a succeeding, succeeding talk uh, about the waste problem. So I wanted to talk about two things. Um, one is the whole thing of the nuclear waste, and with this you can also uh, really fill hours. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm not just talking about it in the nuclear context. So, I, as a reactor physicist, of course, I'm uh, totally biased towards, towards these sort of problems. I, well, I'm, I'm, saying, I'm saying it realistically, it's not the best energy form. I mean, especially when you're talking about things like, like waste. So, the question really is, What are we optimizing? Are we optimizing towards cheapness, towards uh, not enough, not a lot of CO2, uh, towards waste? Yeah. So that's the question. Yeah, it's an exciting topic. You can think about uh, atomic energy what you want, but we should stick with atomic uh, dissolve. And there were one opinion. Microphone number one. Yeah. Thanks for the talk. My question is. The highly enriched uranium wasn't enriched at some point. Couldn't you like spread it somehow so that it isn't enriched anymore? What are you meaning by distribute? Well, uh, only small amounts and uh, very lightly spread, so it's like no risk for the environment. S something like neutral uranium in the end. Well, that's, that exists, it is in the earth. So, so depleted uranium and enriched uranium is kind of really means the same thing. It's it's only about the, the, the mixture of isotope numbers. It's about having more uh, uranium-235 in the highly enriched uranium than in the low enriched uranium. So basically, yeah, you're really doing the same thing. If you're if you're down blending, you're you're using the highly enriched uranium and the depleted uranium and you're mixing them, and as a result, yeah. Well, in the end, in the reactor, you're, you're not really destroying or, well, when you're enriching, you're not really destroying isotopes or creating anything, you're just, just changing the order. You're, you're just having a centrifuge and then you're splitting it up into different pieces. Different, uh, it's, just a, it's just a change of, uh, it's just separation by mass. And of course, you can mix that in the end. So not that simply, but you can mix it. Okay. So basically uh, what you're doing is you're just taking the uranium from the earth and then you're, enrich then you're, you're enriching it and I mean theoretically you could, could, back, could put, it, put it back into the earth and it would be the same as before. <laughs> so roughly at least it's how it works. Not exactly but roughly. Yeah, the question would be why don't they do this? Y yeah, it's, it's yeah we could. I mean, if you did this megatons to megawatt program, then we could do that. And there's also a follow-up program. But uh, yeah, the, the problem is that not not every country wants that their uranium is gone. So not all the countries are uh, want want to um, get rid of all the uh, weapon-grade uranium they have in their inventory and uh, blend it down and and. Uh, get rid of it. So, I mean, yeah, they could, we could do it if it was possible. Yeah, thanks. A uh, question from the Internet. Yeah, here it's a really lot amount of uh, questions and it's about uh, heat. Where do we can, where can we put the heat and will it take effect on the environmental warming and uh, what is just one question after another? Yeah, it's one topic, environmental heating. Global heating. So, I haven't really thought about this. <laughs> 
Um, I haven't really thought about whether the uh, global warming create well the warming created by burning nuclear fuel would have any contribution to the global warming of the Earth. I haven't really. I I, I will think about this. I will I will sit down tomorrow and and <laughs> and will do some some the back of the envelope calculations. Yeah, I will. I will catch Christian Vogel and uh, some other people want to contribute. They're very, very welcome to do so. Be my guest. Um, yeah, the question is of course very interesting. I don't know. I don't know. I have. Ask me again tomorrow. What was the second question? Yeah, what's with the proportion of uh, div division and uh, fusion of uh, yeah. We have some. We have some things. Um, ITER has some prototypes for fission reactions, so there are some uh, ideas about something we could use for for hy for using hydrogen bombs. Uh, basically, fusion and fission are basically, roughly speaking, the same thing. They're just uh, just uh, going in different directions. It's because of the. Um, the mass effect and the stability of the mass effect depending on the um, order number and the energy difference between the core as a whole and the sum of all the parts basically like the bin uh, the, the binding energy of the of the core of the nucleus and that's basically what gets free when you're splitting up the energy or respectively the energy which is freed when you're when you're um, when you're merging the cores and basically you can you can have fission um, releasing energy for proton numbers above 90 that's when it starts to get interesting and that's energy which is released from binding energy of the core's mass defect that's what it's called what's that? yes thank you yeah thanks microphone number three there's someone waiting okay I don't know if this fits to your topic but what do you think what uh, should so, uh, change in a satiety manner so that projects like megatons to megawatts are continued or maybe have succeeding projects and are set up in other countries? No, really. Right now we have a pretty, pretty peaceful society. We don't really have a peaceful society. War is... Um, well, without war, we don't really need hydrogen bombs or atomic bombs. And before, before we don't really have a peaceful society. So, the, the, so the question is, maybe there are financial interests. So the megatons, the megawatts program, um, was not really for reducing the amount of we of weapons. It wasn't really for. For that, it was more of, of financial interest. It was really the idea to get very cheap uranium. And at the same time, of course, our uh, previous enemy also gets rid of all his highly enriched uranium. But overall, it really was about money. Yeah, I think microphone number two was next. Yeah, one question. It, yeah, people say that the term cycle is like uh, the most interesting thing. and. It's like neutral, CO2 neutral and um, more or less secure uh, nuclear technology. Is that right? It depends a bit on the company which builds the reactor. <laughs> this is my honest answer. It depends on the country which puts up the reactor because they have a lot of influence on how the reactor is built, how sa safely it is built, where, how it is pushed whether you have uh, systematic problems in building the reactor. If I could add, wasn't just one of the point about uh, liquid crystal reactors that uh, the liquid crystal needs to be pumped through the reactor all the time and if there's a power loss, then we have a problem? Yes, well, I think we just need to think a bit more about the technology. Um, basically, if you look at the normal pressure water reactor, we also needed 50 years um, how we finally got to an answer, how we make them inherently safe. Basically, how. So, the idea about this is that the, the physics really turns off the reactor. If and um, yeah, so for example, the thing gets hot, the reactor gets hot, therefore, the. Um, the uh, the efficiency of the reactor goes down. I mean, we didn't really know this 50 years ago. It's it's uh, um, yeah, the technology was developed over time. And I have to say that such reactors are not really my speciality. So I have a rough idea how they work, but I don't really know 
um, whether the technology is fine enough that, that all these details have been figured out. I think if you really have to build reactors, one should build the newest generation pressure water reactors in countries which are, um, which are thinking about safety. Um, and not in countries <laughs> like... Um, I, I don't really want to talk about this anymore. <laughs> Thank you. I think that uh, there's num microphone number eight, which is quite dark and anonymous. Hello, yeah. I'm quite shocked to have a talk that is, as far as I understood, promotes to yeah, en en enhance the usage of atom energy. Excuse me, I, I really this triggers me completely because I I just got I just had to had to listen to the same thing on the on the on the on my uh, lecture on the camp. Yeah, I just could go near by accident. Please, please, can you maybe look at the at the recording of the camp, um, and then this will be answered. Can you? But maybe you could at least say your opinion once, because I'm missing a statement. What your opinion is on that topic, and I'm interested in that. So this was not really the topic of the, of this talk. So uh, the topic of of the other talk at the camp. So where we really just talked about it. So the question is really, what do you want to optimize? Do you want to talk for cheap power or C CO2 neutral power or at least uh, very little of of waste? There are a couple of parameters. Uh, which ones do you really want to optimize for? Do we have three minutes? So now, Germany is an organism which keeps the power, which dis gets the power mostly from coal um, power plants. So solar and winds we also have, and water energy also exists. So Germany needs about 51 terawatt hours of per, per year. So organisms Germany needs about uh, 51 terawatt hours per year. So water we cannot really extend anymore because there is just not enough water where we can store this energy. So we can't. We don't really have a lot of uh, space to play around there. So if we want to optimize only towards CO2 neutrality and price, so then the question is how much cents per kilowatts do water power, coal power and all these things cost? Uh, so then we just add the, all these costs, and then we uh, we we we, comp we estimate how much CO2 um, exhaust all these different p powers have, and then we just make a very simple linear optimization, looking at all these parameters, just based on these facts. There are no cons there are some constraints. So for example. So stick, stick ox and uh, nitrous oxides, for example. And so another constraint could be that, that one constraint could be that we just have a certain amount of energy we can get from water power. And uh, if we just do this optimization, you get a solution which which just says nuclear power. What we want is nuclear power. So. It's not completely neutral when it comes to neutral oxides, for example. So, for example, water is not completely uh, neutral to neutral oxide because if you remove the water and it gets free, then there's some neutral oxides released. But if you if you look at all these facts and you optimize into what's price and CO2 neutrality and so I can't really quote these figures now, but please look at the recording and that's where 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 said about uh, talked about this. So basically, yeah, from this the solution is nuclear power. Um, so, it, but but what what I want to stress here, it's about when it's good, when it's made, when it's done good. It's done good. Yeah, I'd like to add, but please no comments. We are switching to microphone number two. I will be near Speedy later, so please just uh, just uh, talk to me there. Or talk to me on Twitter. Uh, contact me on Twitter. I'm very happy to meet up and, and continue the discussion. If I understood that right, uh, I can make f uh, from a neutron and you went to a 38 uh, something splittable. Um, in the castor is then is mo is isn't there mostly UN 238? I honestly don't know. I don't know. I can't answer that. Maybe. Yeah, I think that was one of the main points that uh, yeah it has a high de deterioration time and uh, we can like store it in that way. No, no, no. Okay. So the problem with uranium-238 is that 
So we, the problem is we, we, we're getting plutonium-239 from this, um, but this is not splittable in a normal conventional high-pressure water reactor. You need it with these high-temperature reactors, these, uh, these liquid uh, salt, molten salt reactors, for example. Uh, these high temperatures, which you don't really have in these standard reactors that we have these days, in a normal um, boiling water reactor. But the problem is those, w those kind of reactors which exist most of the time can't really use these plutonium-based power, uh, plutonium-based fuel. So and the other problem is that you want to, you want to save, you need to save, you need to keep your plutonium-239 differently. Yeah, I think we missed our internet quite a bit. Yeah, you did. Um, just a quick feedback. Uh, there's like a very vivid and constructive um, discussion on the internet. Yeah, and one question stick like how many percent from such a missile is uh, staying in the caster as uh, atomic waste? Is it different from at uh, atomic uranium? Yeah, well, it's like apples and pears. It's kind of it's different from the th from the stuff that, that nuclear power plants don't want to have anymore. So for, for so <laughs> where are the Wendland people about the Castor stuff? I, I don't really know a lot about Castors. So these are just just just. Uh, I only know that these are um, containers which are used to safely uh, move nuclear fuel around, uh, nuclear waste around. I don't know much about that. So uh, technically, I don't really know much more about this, so I can't really answer this. So, sorry about that. The question was, is there more atomic waste uh, if we make uh, weapon atomic uranium? Yeah, amount and danger. Oof. Define danger. <laughs> it's really a, quite, a, quite a fishy, fishy thing. I it's usually it's dan it's more dangerous al always in the in the form of which it is in the weapon, but uh, because you can actually make damage with it and you can, yeah, damage towards people. But I don't. That would be my answer. I can't really say. Yeah, I think there's one last question. Microphone number two, please. Yeah, it's like about my understanding. I'm not sure w what uh, is against those trivial solutions to mix like highly enriched uranium with lower enriched uranium. So we get like uh, neutral uranium and we uh, don't need to store it and we um, are yeah, like skipping all this waste problematics. So the problem is this is only a theoretical... Um, so it's only a theoretical thing because the others, you also need to, to get rid of the highly enriched uranium. You also need to get rid of the weapons, but the problem is theoretically you can do it, but uh, in practice you are missing the highly enriched uranium. You're missing the hoy because uh, yeah, it's just not around. So for you can't really do it. Yeah, but it's there anyways. Yes, but uh, the yeah, but it's in it's inside the people which have the weapon silos. They they have about it. So the point is that you could make atomic energy from it, or I don't know why we should do this. Politic is the answer here, really. I think. Yeah, I think we need to stop our talk here. Yeah, but there's a good message. Julia will stay here, and uh, we can ask a question afterwards. I think there's an uh, opinion of the C3 Speedy, so you can spend for a beer there. Thanks also from the translation booth for listening. This was the translation of the talk by Lucaro. MFA. And Oscar.